tonight as we introduce this book and begin, we're going to look at the first five verses and um, kind of preach our way through it, but also use this as an opportunity to kind of set the, uh, the tenor of the book, or at least the approach we're going to take to it, or that I see as being a major theme that's carried throughout this letter. Let me read those first five verses for us. Please follow along. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. now obviously, if you can see in your Bibles, the, the uh, sentence doesn't end there, but uh, we're going to be end it there for our purposes this morning. And I've entitled, taken that, that phrase that he uses there in verse 5, not only is the title of my message tonight, but the theme for this entire book, because I do believe this is what Paul is primarily getting at in this letter, and that is the fellowship in the gospel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time that we've had today already. It's been a blessing to me. I've enjoyed spending this time together with uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm thankful that we have this opportunity this afternoon to gather again. Thank you for the, the hymns. They've been a challenge and encouragement as we've considered and musically praised you for the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. What a blessing to hear the, the good things that are happening there in Bangladesh and the things that you're allowing the karma cars to do for your glory there and continue to pray for them and are encouraged by the work that's going on. As we come now to a portion of your word again, as we begin a new study in, in another one of the uh, New Testament books, I just pray this afternoon that you would guide and direct in this. Um, Father, help us to turn our focus, our attention here, and uh, begin to put ourselves in the circumstances of these Philippian believers that Paul is writing this letter to. Uh, and in so doing, we pray that the words that uh, Paul uh, writ, wrote o over the the course of this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts. Lord, we know that's why these very personal uh, letters that uh, were written to specific individuals or groups of people have been um, carefully preserved in, the, in your word is because the messages here, the lessons here, the truths here uh, were designed to move far beyond the current group and, and begin touching and guiding and directing and instructing believers throughout uh, the entire church age. So, uh, Father, may we receive the benefit from it that you would have us uh, to. We entrust this time to you, and we ask your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever felt alone? Really alone? We were talking a little bit that it's at our table this afternoon. I kind of like being alone in, in many ways. Um, I don't have a problem being alone. Um, I find it helpful, I think, a lot of times, especially for me to study and stuff. The absence of noise and distractions and stuff makes that a much easier task for me to undertake. But even having said that, knowing that I'm kind of a loner by nature, there's difference in purposely separating yourself from others for, for whatever purposes and, and feeling like you're alone. Uh, I don't know that anybody wants to feel alone. Maybe you don't really need people around you or think you need people around you at the moment, but you don't want to get to that place where you feel like you've kind of been abandoned, right, and that there's nobody there. If you wanted them or needed them, they might not be there to help you in that particular situation. There's been a few times in my life where at least for a moment or two I felt alone, but as I reflected on it or as time went forward, I kind of realized later I wasn't really alone, even though maybe I had that feeling or experience at the time. I remember when I was a teenager and God was really beginning to deal with my heart about certain things. And I, I think I even mentioned that in a, in a message a while back, that there was a particular situation that God brought me to in my personal experience. And he really was almost, in, at least in my mind, he was forcing me, it seemed like, to make a decision. Was I going to be serious about this testimony that I was a Christian or was I just going to be content to just kind of follow along the footsteps of my parents and, and family. And I, I really struggled with that for a little while and then eventually made a commitment to the Lord. And I was very serious about that commitment when I made it. And when I did that, I knew, okay, if I'm making this commitment, then that means there needs to be changes. And I was committed enough that I actually went out and made those changes. And when I made those changes, 
It separated me from a lot of people, it separated me from a lot of classmates in school, it separated me from a lot of individuals that uh, I previously uh, had good relationships with, um, even, even fellow Christians, I, I just felt like I needed to make some decisions and make some choices and do some things in my life that, that caused me to not really feel like I could have that kind of relationship with them anymore because they didn't see those things the way I did and they were going a different way. And when that was all happening and unfolding in my life, it really just seemed like all of a sudden I was like, there's nobody else that believes like this. There's nobody else that wants to do these things. I'm all alone. But as I began to reflect on that and think upon that in my life, I began to realize I wasn't really. My parents had not forsaken me. I came to understand clearly. Uh, the pastor of my church had not forsaken me at that time. Maybe we hadn't been as, as close before, but this drew us very much uh, closer because uh, it kind of forced me to have to think through some things. And I went to him to talk about him and realized, hey, he believes so many of these same things I do. He had made some of the same choices and decisions in his life that I was presently making right now. Um, I began to realize that there were other Christians around me. I began to get introduced to other Christians uh, that shared these same beliefs and ideas and feelings that I did. And so I began to realize that I wasn't really all alone. I had felt alone for a period of time, but I was encouraged ultimately to realize I wasn't. We've talked about this experience just not too long ago, and I think our series when we were dealing with prayer, but one of God's prophets, Elijah, was a man who felt alone in his particular experience. He had proclaimed God's word to Israel. He had confronted the sin of, of Israel's king, Ahab, and the queen Jezebel. He had taken a great stand for God there on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal. He had put his reputation on the line, if you will, by declaring that the God of Israel was the only true and living God. He challenged the prophets of Baal to the spiritual duel of sorts. Yet after this, in the great uh, time that God displayed his power and grace and the overthrowing of the prophets of Baal and all of these different things. It was just a few short days or weeks later he finds himself running for his life because Jezebel the queen had said, I'm going to put you to death. And he runs out into the wilderness and he feels that he's all alone. And we know that he felt this way because the Bible records one of his prayers unto God. He said this in 1 Kings 19, 14. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. In response to this confession of Elijah, God simply tells Elijah what his next assignment is. And after he tells him what he's going to do for him, he does conclude his instruction with these words in verse 18 of the same chapter. God says to Elijah, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees of which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Elijah felt alone. We can understand why he would have felt alone in his current circumstance, but the reality was God informed him he was not alone. He may have not known that there were 7,000 others who had not bowed the knees to Baal, but there were. The Bible doesn't tell us what this revelation did for Elijah, but it does record that after this experience, Elijah goes and obeys God's directive, and the scriptures record no more complaining or despair on Elijah's part as God's servant. Maybe you've been there and experienced this in some situation in your life. Maybe you feel for some reason you're going through something like that right now. And the thought of standing alone, especially in spiritual areas, can be a very frightening and discouraging thing. In fact, some have wilted under the pressure, or at least the perceived pressure, that if they were going to do this, they were going to have to do it all alone. That there wouldn't be anybody else that they could rely on or look to or hope to or get encouragement from. No, if they're going to make this decision, it's going to have to be their decision alone. I wonder, does God understand those feelings? I think probably he does, because God does inform us in the scriptures. He knows our frames, that we are but dust. I find that an encouraging statement. You know, you might say, well, what am I, just a, just a, a, a frame of dust? Yes. <laughs> and that maybe isn't all that encouraging in and of itself, but it is encouraging to know God knows that about me. He knows my frailties. He knows my weaknesses. I also think that God understands the struggles that we can have as his people when we feel like we're all alone because the church is his creation. I don't want to trivialize it in any form or fashion, but 
Have you ever thought about it this way? In one sense, the church is first and foremost a support group. In many ways, that's what we are. Over the years, other organizations such as, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and others have kind of come to understand, perhaps just stumbled upon, the tremendous impact that being a part of a support group can have in helping people face their struggles and eventually succeed. It's not the total solution, but just the knowledge that you are not alone in this battle can help one face the struggles that are before them and be willing to take it and move forward for another day. I think the writer of Hebrews understood this reality, and he wrote these words to this, his Christian readers in Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. He said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Well, why would he even have to say that? Because he understood that whatever they were facing, or would face, would cause them to waver. They would be in danger of letting go of this faith that they had started out in. So he said, let us hold fast this profession of faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And then he goes on and gives them this admonishment. And let us consider one another. He's talking about his fellow Christians. To consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The writer of Hebrews obviously understood the potential struggle for those that he was attempting uh, to encourage. And he knew that they needed to hold fast to their profession of faith in the midst of a godless society. And he knew how difficult that was going to be for them. And so he challenges them, what? Come together regularly. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's never a good idea, the writer of Hebrews clearly says there. But he says, even so much more as you see the day approaching. Isn't it sad that sometimes as Christians, we can look around us in our world, we can see what's happening. In many cases we look and we don't know what God's ultimate purpose is, but it appears to our eyes, everything that we hold dear is crumbling around us. It seems like our society is falling apart. All of these things, and we sit around and moan and lament and all these kind of things. But I wonder, does that drive us to come together as God's people more? The writer of Hebrews seems to indicate that's the answer. The answer isn't going out and trying to do all these other things or, you know, to, to lock yourself away in some secure place where you don't have to deal with all the mess that's going on. No, really what the Bible is challenging us there is, no, what you need to do in these kinds of trying times, you need to get together with the rest of God's people. And you guys need to get together and encourage one another. Well, what are you going to encourage one another with? The truth of who we are in Christ Jesus. The truth of the purposes of God. That, that God is bigger than all of this mess. Then in one sense, this mess doesn't even matter in the big scheme of things. We encourage and we strengthen and we encourage and build up one another so that we can face the day knowing we're not facing it alone. I wonder, did the Apostle Paul ever struggle with feeling alone? In his letter to Timothy, Paul wrote these words to Timothy. Timothy, do thy diligence. Come shortly unto me. In other words, Timothy, come and see me as quickly as you can get here. Why? Why did he ask Timothy to do this? Then he gives these things. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens, another individual who obviously had been with him, has left to go to Galatia. Titus, he says, has gone unto Dalmatia. Only Luke, he tells Timothy, is with me right now. He asked Timothy, don't come alone, but bring Mark with you, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus, he says, I've sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. And then he kind of gives a little insight into, again, why was he in need of Timothy, and, and why did he want this, this encouragement from others? He says, Alexander, the coppersmith, has done me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom, if be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words at my first answer. So now as he's recalling this first time he had to stand before the government and give a defense of his faith, he said, at my first answer, no man stood with me. And if that's not enough, he further elaborates, all men forsook me. In Paul's estimation, it wasn't just that somebody else didn't show up to take 
take it on the chin with him and have to stand before and give an answer. They left him alone. (laughs) They didn't want anything to do with him and what he was facing there. And then he prays, "What what a sincere and humble and godly heart. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. When Paul had his first occasion to face the charges leveled against him for preaching the gospel, he says not one person stood with him. He goes on to say that the Lord did stand with him, though, and enabled him to stand. But Paul, I think, did know what it was like to serve God with the feeling that I'm doing it all alone. Nobody else is here to encourage or help me in this. Now, I brought these thoughts to our minds because I'm pretty convinced that This is kind of at the heart of this letter that Paul is writing to the Philippians. This letter is a very, very personal letter, much more so than hardly any of the other epistles, other than maybe like Philemon or something like that. But, you know, this is one that's written to an entire congregation. It's very personal in nature, and it's really a thank you letter. If you look at it, while there's doctrine here and there's truth, there's all kinds of things that are very helpful that we'll get to look at in the coming weeks. At its very essence, it's a thank you letter. And it's a thank you letter to a church that was a church known for sticking with him through thick and thin, through good times and bad. We know that as Paul is writing this particular letter, he's in prison himself. He's under house arrest. He's in Rome awaiting trial before Caesar, and he's taking the time to write this letter to the Philippian church and to thank them for standing with him for the sake of the gospel. And that's where I want to begin in our first message in this book, is by looking at these first five verses, and also then we'll we'll develop and we'll go back into Acts and some other places and look at some of the things that they are referencing and try to learn some things about this situation that's going on. Let's begin with the church itself. Verses 1 and 2, Paul writes, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as Paul is writing this letter, we do know that Timothy is with Paul in Rome at this particular time. He's perhaps the one that's serving as Paul's secretary in the writing of this letter. Paul mentions Timothy by name, more than likely because Timothy had been with Paul when the Philippian church was established. Paul refers to the Philippian church members as saints, he says, from all the saints in Christ Jesus. We know that word saints, the Greek word hagios, means to be holy. It means to be one who is set apart. In this case, people who are set apart unto God. I do think sometimes Christians do not always live saintly lives, but if we are truly saved, then all Christians are saints. Christians are new creatures in Christ Jesus. And as these new creatures in Christ Jesus, we have been set apart unto God, and we have been made His own peculiar treasure. All of the Philippian Christians are described as saints by Paul because all the Philippian Christians are in Christ. If you are saved tonight, you're in Christ. And if you are in Christ, then you're a saint. (laughs) How glorious is that? We're not a saint because we're saintly. We're a saint because we've been made saints through the power of Jesus Christ. We also see from Paul's letter that in the 10 years, and that's the time frame that would have happened from their second missionary journey to the present time that he's writing this letter, that this church has grown and established somewhat to the point that the church now has both bishops and deacons. The word bishops here is the the word being used for the overseers. We also know that this this term and this office is is linked up and is synonymous with the pastors, the the bishops, the elders reference that we find in the New Testament. So this church had, had pastoral leadership and really more than one. It's multiple. It's a plurality of elders here. We don't know how many, but there were more than one because he calls them the bishops. And then he also says there are deacons, those who had been called and elected to a position of organized service. We might think back in our hearts, our minds and, and remember the birthing of the church of Philippi and say, well, I don't remember. I think you will as I recount some of the things that happened there. As I mentioned before, this church came out of the result of Paul's second missionary journey. If you remember, on the second missionary journey was when there was the fallout between Paul and Barnabas, right? There was, you know, they had taken John Mark with them on their first journey and John Mark had turned back and when Barnabas wanted to take him with him the second time, Paul was going to have nothing to do with it. And they had a bickering and a, and, a, and a falling apart. And so Barnabas takes John Mark and they go there where Paul takes Silas and he goes his direction. And the book of Acts is obviously recording primarily that ministry that Paul and Silas had and their group as they went on their second missionary journey. 
We know that Paul had a great desire at that time to go into Asia, and several times he attempted to do so and asked God to allow him to do so, but the book of Acts tells us that every time God would not allow it, the Holy Spirit was forbading him from going. Finally, one night he receives a vision. In this vision, there's a man who comes from Macedonia, and this man calls out unto Paul and says, come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul believes this to be the message in the leadership of the Lord, and so he and his companions cross over into Macedonia. And as we follow that in the book of Acts, the very first city that they come and preach the gospel in is the city of Philippi. Philippi apparently did not have a synagogue. You know, that was often Paul's uh, first point of contact when he went into a community. If there was a Jewish synagogue, he would go there because he had the ability to stand and and to teach the scriptures and to reason and share with them how these Old Testament scriptures were actually pointing to Christ and he was the fulfillment of the Messiah and this was the way he made contact in in each of the cities he went. But apparently Philippi did not have a synagogue and so Paul doesn't go in there. He actually begins looking for ways in which he can make contact with the people in his city. And he eventually one day finds a group of women who are located by the river, and they're actually praying unto Yahweh God. And so Paul comes upon this group of women, and he stops, and he proclaims the gospel unto them. And one of the women, a woman named Lydia, receives the Lord as her personal Savior. We're told in the book of Acts that she goes and and with him, he goes with her to her household, and all of her household hears the gospel and is saved as well. Later in his time in Philippi, he's preaching in the city, and there was apparently a a young lady that was there, a girl, we don't know her age, who was demon-possessed. And men in the city had used this girl in some form or fashion. I don't know whether she could divine or whatever she was able to do, but they were making money off of her. And the demons apparently in this young lady were, were moving her to oppose Saul and she's creating havoc and difficulty for him. And it seems like Saul was content just to let it be for a period of time, but then maybe he gets frustrated and he casts the demons out of this girl. And we don't know whether she got saved. It's a good possibility that she did at that time, but at least the demons have left. And when this happens, the men who were using her could no longer use her and gain money off of her abilities. And so they begin to conspire against Paul and and his companions, and eventually Paul and Silas are cast into prison. As they're there in prison singing praises to God at night while they're in the stocks, we know that a great earthquake shakes the prison during the night. All the prison doors are miraculously opened. The prison guard, fearful that all the prisoners had escaped, preparing to kill himself, hears Paul crying out from within the prison, we're all still here, do yourself no harm. Prison guard comes into Paul trembling, wanting to know, how can I be saved? And Paul, he takes Paul to his house where Paul preaches the gospel unto him and his family, and all of them, we are told, get converted as well. To our knowledge, at least according to the the testimony of the book of Acts, this was the extent of the Philippian church when Paul was forced to move on because of all of the turmoil that was erupting there in that city. But obviously... Perhaps others had already been converted during Paul's time there, but certainly others had been converted converted following that in the following 10 years. And now Paul is writing a letter back to this more mature church during his imprisonment in Rome. As he writes this letter to them in verse 2, he gives a a, a greeting which in many ways just seems uh, normal for us in the Scriptures, but still a greeting that has so much power and, and blessing within. And he writes, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's salutation to the Philippians is that the grace of God was upon them, and because the grace was upon them, they could know peace. They could have this shalom with God because of God's grace that had been manifested unto them in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know this. There could be no peace apart from God's grace, but when we become partakers of God's grace, there can and will be peace. Isn't it amazing to know that we can actually experience peace in this very life, in this very world? And it comes by the grace of God through the person of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is both declaring and proclaiming unto them this grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul moves into this final section of these first verses with his declaration of thankfulness. Verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. It's my contention contention that this really is the essence of this entire epistle. Philippians is a letter of thanksgiving to a particular church, an assembly of believers that had been a tremendous help and blessing to the Apostle Paul. But why 
would Paul be so thankful for these Philippians? What is it about the Philippian church that brought these emotions, these thoughts, these desires, this thanksgiving, this gratitude from the Apostle Paul? Well, we see, according to Paul's testimony here in these first verses, that it is because of their fellowship in the gospel with the Apostle Paul. The word translated fellowship here in our King James Bibles is the Greek word koinonia. It's a, it's a word that comes up quite a few times in our New Testament scriptures. It carries the idea of holding something in common or participating in something in common. Twelve times the Greek word is translated with the word fellowship in our King James Bibles. Four times it's translated in our translations as the word communion. Two times it's translated communication. And one time the King James translates it as distribution. Paul says he thanked God for the Philippians because they fellowshiped with him. The Philippian church communed with him. The Philippian church communicated uh, with him and helped him in the gospel. Now we will undoubtedly talk more about this in the, in the sermons as we move forward in this book. But for tonight, I want to briefly see three ways in which the Philippians fellowshiped with the Apostle Paul in the gospel. The first thing I would point out is this. They fellowshiped with Paul while he was in Philippi. Let's go back to Acts chapter 16. And I've, I've kind of just quickly ran over some of these, but let's actually read a few of these accounts that are listed here and just specifically see the ways in which these Philippians fellowshiped with Paul in the gospel while he was in Philippi. Acts chapter 16, verse 11 Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by the riverside, where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you had judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Then if you skip over to verse 30, same chapter. This is, this is as Paul is in the prison at night and the doors have been opened and uh, in verse 30, it says, And brought them out, the jailer, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. And then in verse 40, at the very end of that chapter, we read, And they went out, this is after their... Uh, they're dealt with by the, the magistrates of the city. It says, And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Now, Paul was not in Philippi for a very long time. But while he was there, we do see this in these brief accountings. He lacked no assistance in his efforts to proclaim or minister the gospel. His very first convert, a woman named Lydia, we are told immediately. All right, This isn't like a week or a month from now after she's grown in grace. This isn't a year or ten years later after she's somehow gotten a heartbeat for the things of God. No, the very day of her salvation, immediately she opens up her house to the apostle and his companions so that they could use her home as a base of operations for their gospel efforts. Food, obviously, was given to them. Shelter was afforded them. A place of study was made available to them to teach and to minister all the needful things of the gospel work. And Lydia desired to provide these things for Paul while he was there in Philippi. The Philippian jailer, there, after his salvation, opened up his house as well to Paul and Silas. He doctored their wounds. He fed them. He gave them a place of comfort after a very harrowing ordeal. And after their release from prison, and until the time that they were forced to leave the city of Philippi, were informed once again that Lydia's home was opened unto them as a base of operation. It's not stated explicitly, but the wording of Acts would lead us to believe that when Paul and his companions left Philippi, Luke was perhaps left behind to help this fledgling church. I wonder if that's the case, where did Luke stay after their departure? 
And this new body of believers, where did they gather together to begin to meet and worship together and study the word and to grow in grace as a fledgling young church? We cannot know for sure again because the, the book of Acts doesn't tell us specifically, but should we have any doubts that it wouldn't have possibly been Lydia's home or the jailer's home that became the church's base of operations? And why would we find it amazing if that is what happened? Because both Lydia and the jailer desired to fellowship with Paul in the gospel. <laughs> they were the recipients of the gospel. Yes, that's the most important thing. But once they received it, what? There was a transformation of their heart and mind and desire. And immediately they wanted to engage in this great work and however they could. And at least one of the things they could do was open up their house and be a part of the ministry that was going on by these servants of the Lord in Philippi. We also know that they were a blessing or they fellowship with Paul in the gospel at the time that he was in Thessalonica. If you're back in Philippians, turn to the fourth chapter and we just have a statement there that informs us of something that's quite important though. Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, we read this. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia... No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. The next place that Acts tells us that the apostles preached the gospel and saw people saved was in the city of Thessalonica. And unfortunately, they were not allowed to stay in Thessalonica very long either because the persecution followed them and forced them eventually from that city. Yet in their short time that they were there ministering in the city of Thessalonica, Paul tells us here in the end of this Philippians letter that the Philippian church sent at least two offerings unto them. They gathered money or material things that could help, the, to help Paul and Silas, and they traveled with it to Thessalonica and delivered it to them so that they could continue to minister and be a blessing to them. A few cities later... From this, if we were to follow the Acts account, we find that Paul eventually ends up in the city of Corinth. And he ended up staying in the city of Corinth for almost a year and a half when you put all the dates together in the book of Acts. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul tells the Corinthians that while he was there with them, given their mindset and given their upbringing and their attitude, that he said, I never once asked for any money for you Corinthians. I didn't want or desire any money because I was fearful if I did that you would think I was selling the gospel and that the, the gospel could be purchased. But while he was there in Corinth, yes, he did work. He was a tent maker. He tried to support himself that way as well. But we also know that he received financial support from a church or churches in Macedonia. Can there be any doubt that at least one of the churches that he's speaking of is the church in Philippi? They already have that attitude and spirit of serving him. And I have no doubt when he said, I received some help from the churches in Macedonia, that this church would have been one that sent that need unto him while he was living there in Corinth. So this Philippian church, a church of brand new converts, desired to commune with Paul in the gospel. And they were looking for ways in which they could be a help. And so one of the ways they knew they could would be to send him money or financial support or material support so that Paul could continue to do his gospel ministry as he traveled throughout Macedonia and beyond. So we find this little fledgling church being... Uh, fellowshipping with him in the gospel right after their conversion there in Philippi, but opening their houses and, and other things to the ministry. We find that they were fellowshipping in the gospel as Paul was forced to leave Philippi and go on through Macedonia by sending offerings and material needs to meet to the, their, and help minister to them as they served in the gospel. And then thirdly, I think we learn from our text that they were fellowshipping with Paul while he was even in prison. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, No, chapter 2, I'm sorry. Chapter 2, verses 24 through 30. We read, But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly, yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. 
I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. And then in chapter four, in verse 10, Paul writes this to the church there at Philippi, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last year care of me hath flourished again, wherein you also were careful, but you lacked opportunity. And in verse 18, But I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphrodite the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. If you put the pieces of the puzzle together, it seems pretty clear that the Philippians at some point lost track of where Paul was in his ministry. Part of that probably was because of his arrest and, and his weird journey on his way to stand before Caesar. But when they eventually found out where he was, they found out he's in Rome, he's under house arrest, they take one of the men from their congregation, a man named Epaphroditus, and they send him with an offering unto Paul while he's there in Rome. Paul informs us that Epaphroditus had brought this financial offering to the Philippians with him, and that he also had been commissioned by the congregation to stay with Paul and to help him in any way that he possibly could. Apparently, he had been so committed to this particular task and probably labored so intently in his service for the Apostle Paul that he apparently got seriously ill himself, and they thought he was going to die. Now that he had fully recovered, Paul was actually sending this thank you letter back with Epaphroditus as he returned him to the congregation to thank them for all that he had done. Why was Epaphroditus sent to Rome to give Paul an offering and to assist him in any way that he possibly could? The only logical answer is because the Philippian church wanted to fellowship with Paul in the gospel. And Paul, as he's writing and introducing this letter in our opening verses tonight, writes, he says, every time I think of you, every time you, the Philippian Christians, come to my mind, I thank God for you, and I thank him for your fellowship in the gospel. As we study this letter further, we will find that the Philippians were fellowshipping in the gospel in another way as well. Apparently, they were being persecuted for their faith in the gospel and their preaching of the gospel in Philippi, and just as Paul was being persecuted in Rome. Some even think that some of the Philippians had been put into prison because of their faith and, and their declaration of the gospel. In Paul's letter here, he brings out some of his own sufferings as a means of encouragement to the Philippians that they also would remain strong and firmly committed to the gospel in spite of the suffering that they were going through in their lives. What would it be like to be the only Christian in the world? If you were the only saved person, could you make it? Could you stand? Could you remain faithful and true to the Lord if you were the only one? Paul, at times, we read, felt alone. But he was reminded that he was not alone. Probably in various ways. But one of the ways, one of the times that he was reminded that he wasn't alone was that he was under house arrest and I don't know how it all worked out, but in my mind, I just envisioned perhaps one day there came a knock on the door of the place where he was being held. And when either he was allowed to open the door or the, or the guard that was with him opened the door, outside the door stood a man named Epaphroditus. And I don't know exactly what he said, but maybe along the lines is, Paul, <laughs> I bring you greetings from the church at Philippi. And I have brought an offering to help meet your needs. And I also am commissioned to stay here with you and to serve you in any way that I possibly can as you serve the Lord here in Rome. I don't know if the day that he arrived, if Paul was dealing with discouragement and perhaps thinking that he had been forsaken again and was all alone. I don't know. But I can almost envision as Epaphroditus stands there and offers him this offering and shares these glowing words of what he's there to do. Maybe Paul turns his back on Epaphroditus because he doesn't want him to see his face, the tears that are flowing down his cheeks. Maybe he moves to another place within the room where he is being held, and he falls down on his knees, and he weeps and begins praising the Lord. And maybe his thoughts and his words to the Father are this, Thank you, Father, for reminding me that I'm not alone. I'm not alone. All have not forsaken you. And therefore, all have not forsaken me. And I know that one church, at least, 
the church in Philippi is committed to the gospel. They are desirous to serve you, and they're desirous to serve me. And my labor in Philippi was not in vain. No wonder Paul took the time to write this glowing thank you letter to this particular church. He wanted to do this because he was enjoying fellowship with the Philippian church in the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we wrap up this introductory lesson and message this, this afternoon, let me ask you this question. Where is your fellowship What occupies your thoughts? What desires drive you? What are you willing to expend your energies or your treasures upon? What is your life devoted to? We get the picture here, even in these few instances that are recorded in the scriptures, that this Philippian church was deeply committed to the concept of the gospel going forth, and they wanted to fellowship in this. As far as we know, not any of the Philippian congregation was called by God to any apostolic ministry or even vocational missionary service. But it would appear that every one of them deeply in their heart believed that they should be, and they were committed to a full-time fellowship in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we study this letter over the coming weeks, I think we're going to better understand what it means to fellowship in the gospel. And we will be able to better understand then what the gospel is. But even this afternoon, I would ask you this, where do your aspirations lie? Are you fellowshipping in the gospel even now? How can a Christian honestly contemplate the reality of God's purposes within the gospel and not then want to devote themselves to it in any way that they possibly can? When Paul meets Lydia and she gets converted in her household, we're told that she's a seller of purple. So she's a businesswoman. She has some enterprise that's going on in her life. We are not told in the scriptures that she gave up that enterprise. As far as we know, she continued on with this business of being a seller of purple for the rest of her days, as long as she was able. So it's not that the becoming a Christian or the call of God upon our life necessarily changes our vocation in that sense. Lydia didn't move away from being a seller of purple and become a missionary out on the field. But in the scope of her life, everything did change. She now realized that maybe her business as a seller of purple was really something God had given under her as a basis by which she could fellowship in the gospel. So she began looking at the money she was making through her business and began asking herself serious questions, gospel questions. What should I do with this money? How do I invest this money? What's the best thing I could do with this in order to further God's purposes here on earth? And we don't know all that she did, but we get a glimpse of what she did. Number one, she first opened her home. Then she was obviously part of, of this, this effort to raise funds to send to, to Paul to help further the ministry. And she certainly was on board with whatever was going on in their efforts to send Epaphroditus to be an ongoing blessing to the Apostle Paul. The Philippian jailer may have been a government worker, a civil servant, and as far as we know, he didn't give up his job or lose his job. But after he gets converted, his purpose in life is different. It doesn't mean he still has a task to go every day and make sure that the jailhouse is taken care of and the prisoners are secured and, and, and fed and maintained just as his job had been before. But now he has a even greater understanding of what life is all about. And he doesn't get up every day only thinking, my only purpose for existence is to be a jailkeeper. No, my purpose for existence is to be a Christian and to fellowship in the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do I use my abilities and, and what I receive from my vocation to help me better fellowship in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Paul may have been a stranger to these individuals in Philippi when he came there to preach the gospel a few years ago. But now, even though Paul had only stayed there a few months perhaps, maybe only a few weeks, they now counted Paul as the dearest of friends. And they were desirous to in any way possible be co-laborers together with the Apostle Paul in his ministry within the gospel. All we can surmise from this ordeal is that the fact the gospel changed their lives. They weren't the same 
after they came in contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we also can surmise this. The gospel gave them brand new purpose in life. I do think, and maybe this has been a failure on the part of ministers and people in vocational ministry, maybe we give the impression, you're not really a good Christian, you're not really serving the Lord unless you're in full-time Christian service. That, nothing could be further from the truth. God only calls a, a few, really, a handful of people to full-time Christian service in the sense of a vocational type of ministry. But maybe that gives a bunch of people an out, too, to say, well, as long as I'm not called to full-time ministry, then I don't have any purpose in the gospel. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Our entire lives is the gospel. The gospel isn't just, shouldn't just saturate the mind of the preachers and the missionaries. The gospel should be saturating your mind every day. You should be asking yourself, how am I going to further the cause of Christ today? How do I take what I gain from my job and further the gospel purposes? How do I take this home that God has given to me and use it for gospel purposes? How am I going to engage and fellowship and commune in what God is doing in this world, the most important thing in all of eternity? How am I engaged? This is what happened in Philippi. The gospel came, people were converted, and their lives were never the same. They were transformed by the gospel, and they knew that the gospel was the thing that they needed to be most committed to every day for the rest of their lives. I wonder, Christian, are you fellowshipping in the gospel? Does it drive you? Does it change your decisions? Has it made life different for you? Pray tell me, if it hasn't, then what is the gospel anyway? I thought the gospel gave us new life. I thought the whole point of the gospel was to change everything. If we're no different after we got saved, then what did it mean to get saved? It means that a life that was alienated from God and was lived in enmity with God has now been graciously purchased and bought back and redeemed at the greatest of prices. And we've been given a new life and the Spirit of God living within us to empower and enable us to now take this worthless dust creature jar of clay and do everything within my power to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am given the possibility to fellowship in the gospel. And I think that's why Paul is writing this church. He just wants to encourage them in what they are doing. It is what captivated them the most. It was their fellowship in the gospel. As we read this book and as we study it in the coming weeks, I trust the Lord will take it and speak to our hearts and show us ways in which we can further be engaged in the fellowship in the gospel. Father, this afternoon, thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimony of this church. Oh, that the testimony of Abundant Life Baptist Church could be very similar. And I think it is possible, Lord, but it, it becomes a reality when we, as the Christians who make up this church, begin thinking biblically about what you are doing in and through us. And we realize you are probably not calling many of us to vocational ministry. That's not the point here tonight. But that you are, you have redeemed every one of us if we're saved tonight to fellowship in the gospel. And I pray as we read Paul's words and his, his encouragement and his thanks and his exhortations in this letter as we move forward, that you will use it in our lives to further encourage and strengthen and educate us in how we can better fellowship in the gospel as well. Lord, if we're here this afternoon and we've heard this initial message and your spirit is convicting us, maybe you revealed to us even tonight that we have not really truly committed our lives to the, your purposes in this world through the gospel. And maybe tonight is the night that we need to make a decision for you and say, God, help it to be different. Show me what you want me to do. And then put feet to those prayers as you begin to engage and do the things that he has called you to do to fellowship in his gospel. Lord, thank you for your word. Use it as you see fit in our lives tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.